So the United Nations have predicted that we need 70% more food by 2050. 70%. How are we going to achieve this when only 10% of the Earth's surface is suitable for agriculture? And we use a third of that to grow livestock feed. Then there are the warnings that we have 60 years of harvest left due to soil degradation. And then there's the issue with water. Agriculture uses a staggering 67% of global fresh water supplies annually. And then there's a the prediction that 80% of the population will live in cities by the middle of this century. We have a problem. We need to think differently about the future of our food production. And this will involve finding cost-effective, centrally located, commercially sized spaces to farm, especially in cities. And this is how I ended up here talking to you today. 10 years ago, at the height of the economic crash, the business that I'd been running since my early 20s was on the brink of collapse. After it was all over, I was left with quite a lot of time on my hands. And this enabled me to rethink my life's path and decide what I wanted to do for the future. And before I knew it, I was filling out student loan and university applications and moving to the capital to embark on a film degree, which was something I really wanted to do when I was younger, much to the amusement of my friends who thought I was having a midlife crisis, which I think I probably was. When I arrived in the capital, I had a real thirst for knowledge. I had an idea about a film about hidden London. I was fascinated with what was going on underneath my feet, the history, and things like Crossrail were being built at the time. And this seemed like a great idea for a film. As well as this, I was really interested with what was going on above ground, the future of cities. How are we going to manage them sustainably? And the technology, what technology we use to use them efficiently? This led me to the futurist and author, Jeremy Rifkin, whose ideas around the future, the, the democratization of energy and the third industrial revolution really resonated with me. For my final thesis, I produced a film. And for this film, I asked the question, how are cities of the future going to feed and power themselves with a growing population? An extra two billion people expected on the planet in the next 30 years. This passion went beyond finishing the film. And I found myself doing lots of research. And I found it was possible now to grow food without the aid of natural sunlight using LEDs. I also realized it was possible to grow large amounts of produce in a small space with the right equipment. I spoke to my friend Steve, who had just received his pension renewal letter saying it would mature in 2036. He said, I don't want to wait there until then. I want out of this. I want to do something different. So we did some calculations. One thing led to another. And like you do, we started looking for a tunnel. <laughs> the first space we looked at was underneath the city of London, underneath Holborn. This was the former MI6 communications hub between the former Soviet Union and the USA during the Cold War. Totally classified until the 1990s. Very difficult to gain access to. We also knew about the tunnels in Clapham, uh, that were owned by Transport for London. And we approached them and they were quite intrigued with our idea and they invited us down to have a look. When we got there and we saw the space for the first time, we realized what, this was the, the correct place, this was the right place for us. It was of commercial size. And around this time we brought in another director called Chris who had a wealth of experience in hydroponics. And he said, you just need to get in there and start growing something and, and do a trial. So we asked TFL, um, we put a, a basic agreement together, and hey presto, we had ourselves a tunnel, and Growing Underground was born. Growing Underground is an urban farm situated 33 metres under the streets of Clapham, London, in a World War II air raid shelter. The tunnels were built between 1940 and 1942. There are a family of seven stretching from Belsize Park in the north of the capital all the way through to Clapham South in the southwest. They housed 8,000 people during the war. TfL uh, inherited the tunnels from the government in the 1990s, and some of them were used for paper and document storage. 
The two tunnels are half a kilometre in length. And there's about 65,000 square feet of space, which is about 6,000 square meters. And the northern line and the tube network actually travels four stories above us. So the trains actually travel above us. And we have um, a mezzanine floor that goes through the center of the tunnel, and that creates two floors. We use the top level for growing and the lower level for water tanks, pumps, utilities, that sort of thing. During the war, they would have had bunk beds on three high on both levels. This is my business partner tending to our first harvest. <laughs> we use hydroponics and LEDs to produce microgreens, which are tiny herbs packed full of flavor. Some of the micros we grow include pea shoots, coriander, um, salad rocket, fennel, wasabi mustard. We tailor light spectrums according to our crop. Some crops prefer more red light, some prefer more blue. Tailoring light spectrums allows us to do precise tweaks in sugars and starches and allowing us to create the optimum plant in taste, nutrient and uh, yield. After we trialed the first meter by meter unit, we moved to phase two. We needed to know that growing in redundant urban spaces stacked up financially. And this space enabled us to do some seed density and yield trials, uh, as well as collating our own data. We also used this space to um, attract investment, which came in the form of 600,000 pounds in our first round on the crowdf uh, crowdfunding website. We wanted to farm sustainably and efficiently producing hyper-local food for the city from within the city, reducing food miles, distribution models, pollution, and shelf life by giving our uh, customers um, a longer, longer shelf life. <clears throat> growing in this environment is actually a very efficient way of growing. We have a year-round temperature of about 15 degrees. Our micros prefer between, between 20 and 25 degrees. As well as producing light, our LEDs produce heat. Uh, using that heat and some ventilation from both ends of the tunnel and some air movement within the tunnel, we can create the optimum environment for, for growing and, and create that year round. We also produce more harvest than conventional outdoor agriculture and, and greenhouse with the same crop. So if we took pea shoots, for example, outside you'll get five to six harvests a year. In a greenhouse, about 25 to 30. But in our farm or in controlled environment agriculture, you can get up to 60 harvests a year. Any business starting today really needs to think about its impact on the environment. And this was one of the key drivers for us when we set the business up. So we use a hydroponic system which uses 70% less water than conventional agriculture methods. We create electricity from our waste which we send into South East London to a waste to energy CHP converter and electricity is produced. And we use that to offset our carbon footprint. We are working towards carbon neutrality. Anything we purchase for the farm, any product, any service has carbon embedded in it. And we tally that up and offset that. It was really important for us to stick a flag in the ground and make a stance on this issue. We live in a carbon economy and we all know we have to evolve out of that into a more sustainable, circular economy. And this was our way of making a stance on that issue. We also power the site entirely by renewable energy. We use off-site wind, solar, and some hydro, which we get across the grid to power the site in Clapham. <clears throat> in 2015, after closing the investment round, we built the farm we have today. We pack the produce on site, we ship it into New Covent Garden Market, which is London's largest wholesale food, um, fresh produce market, which is less than a mile down the road from the tunnel. And from there, our produce is distributed over the capital to hotels, restaurants, and retailers. We're now supplying some of the major supermarkets within the capital. And this method of farming locally, reliably, and with little effect on the environment, enables us to create food security for a city or a state. We also don't use any pesticides on our crops. These advancements in technology and agriculture 
or inspiring a younger generation, which is needed when the average age of a farmer is now 60 years of age across the world. Automation will also play more of a role in the future of agriculture and food production over the next few years. But we're going to see exponential growth in technology, and that's across the board in general. But you'll see this with LEDs, their efficiencies, light spectrums, and light recipes. Cloud computing, the Internet of Things, and sensors are going to play a significant role in the future of agriculture. Currently, there are 14 billion sensors in operation around the world. By 2020, that would have doubled to 30 billion. But by 2030, it's predicted there'll be 100 trillion. And that's that exponential growth curve in technology that we're seeing across the board. Cloud computing and sensors enable us to recreate agricultural environments. In Italy in 2009, there was a perfect vintage year for basil. Amazing flavor, taste, texture, and yield. And an urban farmer looked at the weather conditions for that year and set about recreating that perfect vintage year in a shipping container in New York City. He looked at what time the sun came up, what time it set, the amount of CO2 and oxygen in the atmosphere, the temperature, humidity, everything. He now produces uh, an optimum crop that he supplies into his local community consistently. And in the future, this could see us producing Peruvian coffee beans in a warehouse in the UK somewhere, or replicating the perfect vintage year for wine consistently. For us, we're not going to change world, we're not going to um, address world hunger by producing microgreens for high-end retailers. But we do believe this is one small step towards achieving this. <clears throat> in the grand scheme of things, LEDs and controlled environment agriculture are in their infancy. But the real game changer comes in the not too distant future when we have an abundance of cheap renewable energy, battery storage, and this exponential growth curve in technology. And we can start to produce the full spectrum of vegetables and the staples like wheat, soy, and maize. And then this will see ourselves and other companies building large vertical farms inside, under, on the outskirts of major conurbations. And this will in turn allow current threatened agriculture land from soil degradation or other environments such as rainforests to replenish and go back to their natural form. And hopefully this combination will enable us to achieve that additional 70% more food required by 2050, whilst being mindful of the planet and its resources. And at Growing Underground, we like to think we are playing a small role towards achieving that. Thank you very much. <laughs>